Hello, today we're going to learn about what's the most effective way to deal with nuisance algae in reef ecosystems. Hello and welcome back everyone to Amra Azul TV and another episode of Reef Science. I'm very excited about today's video. It's taken me a long time to produce this video because it, it involved a lot of uh, actually research. Uh, I've been reading a lot of uh, peer-reviewed scientific literature on reef health, reef biology, nutrients, algae and all of that jazz. And today I'm, I'm hoping to present this video to you uh, and present this new idea. You, some of you, I know many of you will probably find it controversial. Uh, but hopefully uh, it will present a new idea about the role of nutrients, algae, corals, and, and promoting stability of reef ecosystems. And, uh, and maybe this will offer you some uh, uh, different ideas about how to run your tank and how to maintain your tank. All right, so let's start. Uh, imagine you know, you're setting up your first tank, and, and this is kind of my experience, my personal experience, as well as uh, many others. You know, you're really excited, you have your uh, tank, you have all of these shiny new equipment, you set it up, you have your uh, uh, rock and, uh, and you add a few corals and pretty soon you start getting, you know, green hair algae or, or some kind of like uh, some growth of algae that you, uh, you're you not really happy about. So you kind of panic, you go on the forums and you post a couple of questions on reef to reef or ultimate reef <laughs> or nano reef, you, you guys know where. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're like, hey guys, I have an algae problem, what can I do? And the first thing that you often always get is like, what is your uh, nitrate levels and what is your phosphate levels? And, you know, it's like you do your tests. I'm like, oh, you know, I got like a little bit of nitrates or a little bit of phosphates. And then the most common advice is like, okay, well, you have to run GFO or run some kind of carbon dosing and you need to kind of remove all of this excess nutrients. Uh, why you may ask? Well, because natural reef ecosystems typically have undetectable nitrates and phosphates so therefore uh, uh, the excess nutrients that you have in your tank is probably fueling the growth of uh, the algae so you do so maybe you do carbon dosing uh, maybe uh, you uh, add gfo uh, or you dose you know some vibrant or something and then the green hair algae goes away but a few weeks later you get cyano maybe you even uh, get dinos and now your tank looks uglier than ever and you struggle and you struggle and you get more aggressive with uh, removing nitrates uh, over skimming and and uh, and all of that and eventually like for many of us including myself that, that kind of gets to a place where you're so just fed up with your system that uh, many people do tear up their tanks and 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 call it quits and and uh, uh, and for me I, I did kind of stuck out with it and, and I'm, I'm happy that I did I, I honestly did want to quit my tank seven months in uh, but now my tank is you know five years old mature and, and uh, looks as uh, good as ever so all of this scenario leads to a, a kind of a worldview about reefing and, and how there what's the relationship between nitrates uh, sorry nutrients algae and coral so you're essentially buying into the idea that excess nutrients lead to algae that reef systems should have very low nutrients and and for you to have the lovely coral garden that you want to have you have to do the best that you can to remove excess nutrients and eliminate algae so it's it's a very bottom down approach bottom down meaning that okay it's the nutrients in the system that lead to that cause the system to look as it does right so high nutrients ugly tanks for of algae low nutrients beautiful tanks for of coral uh, so this is the the, the prevailing wisdom that, that I wanna like uh, I want you to kind of think about and and question uh, and think about it more critically, and I'll I'll start with uh, what's called Darwin's paradox and and this idea that uh, reef ecosystems are are have uh, low nutrients and and so this this idea that okay you know coral reefs exist in very nutrient poor water uh, has bothered you know the best biologists of all time arguably uh charles darwin he he called this uh, darwin's paradox and darwin's paradox is is how can we have this amazingly diverse and rich ecosystem uh living in waters that has essentially no energy no no uh, no nitrates no phosphates no no detectable nutrients right where where, where is this energy coming to the corals from to lead to these uh, really diverse ecosystems if, if there's nothing in the water right 
And we know from recent research is, is that this, this idea that uh, reef ecosystems are actually nutrient poor is not all that it's cracked out to be. So I'm going to present a, a couple of papers that kind of summarize research that has been done over the past uh, 10 and 15 years on reef ecosystems. And it turns out that actually reef ecosystems are, are very uh, energetic in terms of the amount of nutrients that are found uh, near corals. Uh, but it's not uh, what, what you have to understand is that the energy is not stored up as molecules, uh, soluble molecules floating in the water but are essentially packaged in other organisms and, and, and animals that then uh, when they die or are being consumed by, uh, by the trophic system found in coral reefs. So instead of the nitrates and phosphates being free floating in the water, they're actually being sequestered by either phytoplankton or sponges and, and many other microorganisms that are living in the water. Uh, so the first paper is a review uh, on the, uh, the bio, uh, biogeochemical importance of sponges on, on coral reefs and they present this model uh, based on uh, several years of uh, research about how sponges are actually really important for cycling uh, nutrients uh, and, and essentially uh, energy and, and molecules that the corals need to live uh, uh, in, in reef ecosystems. Uh, so they do so by essentially uh, uh, taking up uh, dissolved organic carbon in the water and making that available uh, to other, uh, other animals, including corals, uh, in the form of uh, detritus, as well as the pr uh, production of uh, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, things like ammonia and, and nitrates and, uh, uh, and nitrites and, and nitrates. The other paper that I'm going to show you is on the role of uh, phytoplankton. So this was uh, published in Nature Communications in uh, 2015. And it presents this uh, really cool model uh, where uh, essentially a lot of the nutrients that are going into uh, into the water near coral ecosystems are quickly taken up uh, uh, by phytoplankton and the phytoplankton essentially then drift over the corals uh, providing re-releasing re these energies and nutrients in the form of food for corals and, and animals that uh, uh, live and exist in coral uh, reef ecosystems so it, it's an, it's another kind of variant of uh, uh, the sponge hypothesis, but the idea is, is that the phytoplankton is is the main kind of compartment or one of the main compartments that kind of stores and provides energy and nutrients to the animal uh, living in coral ecosystems. So coral reef ecosystems are indeed very energy rich. It's just the natural reefs. Uh, this this energy is bound up within organisms and it's not free floating in the water column. And this is going to have some implications about what's limiting algae in coral reefs, uh, whether it's actually nutrients or whether it's actually uh, uh, the herbivores that are uh, predating on the algae. Okay, so this brings us to the next point. So if, if coral reefs, natural coral reefs, uh, have a lot of nutrients available in, in the form of organisms uh, that could be consumed uh, to release this energy, then wh why do we find very little algae in coral reefs, in mature coral reefs, right? So uh, we're looking at pictures of uh, uh, videos of uh, the Red Sea, you know, beautiful uh, diving if you've ever uh, been, and you know, you're looking at these coral reefs and you're, you're not noticing the algae. So why, why is the algae not there? It's not lack of nutrients because the nutrients exist, they're just bound up in cells. So uh, what, it, what is it that is really limiting? And uh, I'm gonna show you a set of experiments that I think answer this question very clearly and they indicate the important role of herbivores and, and grazers uh, as a top-down control to algae populations in reef systems. So there were many papers that I could have uh, chose to show you here, but I, I picked three uh, that I, I think kind of illustrate the point. Uh, the first one, the, uh, the oldest one also, is uh, a paper published uh, by Miller et al. in Limnology and Oceanography, a very respected journal, uh, in 1999. Uh, this was done in coral reefs near Florida, and they essentially did the experiment where they excluded herbivores uh, and and uh, they also controlled nutrients. Uh, there was ambient, but then they also enri have enriched nutrients. Uh, and what they found, and uh, the study is a, a little bit difficult to track, but I'm gonna show you figure five, I believe here, yeah. Uh, and so what you're looking at is uh, uh, different growth of algae. Uh, uh, so uh, 
you have uh, turf algae, uh, blue green algae, frond nose algae, and the bottom here is bear and uh, 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 crustose. That's actually a coralline algae. And uh, the different plots are showing you uh, controlled. Uh, uh, so these are uh, regular water and ambient neutral at ambient neutral levels. Uh, with a cage, a full cage that excludes all uh, herbivores or almost all grazers and a half cage that allows more uh, uh, grazers and herbivores to go in and then uh, you're seeing the enriched environment, the enriched environment that means there was also in addition to manipulating the amount of herbivores on the reefs there was an addition of nutrients. Uh, and what you see here is uh, pretty much in all for the top three, right? Remember the top three are the bad algae that uh, we don't want to see in, in, in reef ecosystems or in actual uh, in our tanks. Uh, the full cage experiment, uh, the bars are higher than the half cage experiment. So the clear bars are always higher for the first three panels here than the dashed bars here. So that indicates that there is more algal growth in, in the areas of the reef where herbivores were excluded, right? So herbivores are, are actively keeping algae levels down in reef, natural reef ecosystems. And it turns out that for this experiment at least, adding more nutrients did not have an effect, right? So uh, remember the hypothesis is, is uh, if, if we believe in a top-down view, algae cause uh, nutrients, excess nutrients cause algae, uh, then w if we enrich the water with nutrients, then we should see more algae. But it turns out that actually was not the case. There, uh, there is no kind of big difference between uh, these two bars here. Uh, and, and the biggest difference in the study was actually herbivores. So uh, herbivores uh, top down control of algae is much more significant than bottom up control of algae. So herbivores trump nutrients. Uh, if you have another way to say it, if you have the herbivores, then having more nutrients in your tank, it's not gonna matter that much with respect to the amount of algae that you see. All right, so this is uh, paper one. Uh, I'm gonna shift to another paper. This is a more recent paper published in 2007 in the journal Current Biology, again, very respected journal. It's called Phase Shifts, Herbivory and the Resilience of Coral Reefs to Climate Change by Hughes et al. Uh, so uh, another very similar experiment where uh, they excluded herbivores uh, with cages, full cages or partial cages uh, in coral reefs. And uh, if you look at figure two here, panel A, uh, the algal cover as a percent uh, uh, as a function of whether we had open plots with herbivores, partial cages that excluded some herbivores or full cages that excluded a large proportion of the herbivores as a function of experiment time. And you could see in, in uh, open and partially open cages, there is very little algal growth, right? That's, that's what we see in a healthy uh, reef ecosystems, that there, there is very little algae. Uh, but we exclude the cages, we, we add cages that exclude herbivores, and all of a sudden we, st we start seeing the growth of algae. I think this figure is actually really important because it's telling you that under normal circumstances, algae don't establish in reef ecosystems, not because there isn't available nutrients for them to grow, but because the herbivores are there to keep them in check, right? Uh, because once you remove the herbivores, if even if you don't change the nutrient levels, you see algae, right? So the, the blue dots here, the blue graph, is what happens not when we increase nutrients in a system, like we think how algae problems happen, right? We, we, we gave the system too much phosphorus or too much nitrates. Uh, certainly that has something to do with it. But what this figure is telling you is that if you don't really change any of the water chemistry at all, and you just remove herbivores, you start seeing algae. I.e. algae is controlled top down by herbivores and not necessarily bottom up by nutrients, right? K key point to think about when, when we are thinking about how we wanna manage and keep our reefs and, and whether, you know, one parts per million of nitrates or you know, <laughs> 0 0.05 uh, uh, parts per million of phosphates is, is a big deal. Uh, all right, the third study that I wanna show you uh, was uh, also recently published in uh, Nature Scientific Reports. It is by, uh, how did I pronounce that last name? Uh, <laughs> oh man, so, some last names just get me. 
All right, let, let's just say Caitlin and Andrew. <laughs> uh, Caitlin and Andrew uh, published this uh, uh, article in 2016. It's called The Emergent Role of Small Bodied Herbivores in Pre Emptying Phase Shifts on Degraded Coral Reefs. There's a couple of figures that I want to show you in this paper. The first one is figure four. Here you're looking at the me uh, mean, the average algal biomass. Uh, on the experimental tiles under this uh, full factorial design where you have ambient levels of nutrients, so low as well as enriched, and uh, areas that have a full cage to exclude all herbivores or almost all herbivores, uh, cage control and an open plot. Uh, and so you see these three, uh, these three kind of treatment types in the ambient and enriched. And again, what you see right away is that if you look at ambient, there is a big difference between the black bars here and the gray and the white bars, right? So the full cage, uh, by excluding uh, herbivores, we get a huge amount of algae, right? Paradoxically, actually, as we enrich, <laughs> uh, when we enrich the water with nutrients, the algae level got down, uh, but we still see the main effect of the excluding herbivores. So if you focus on uh, the enriched bars here, uh, the low, the black bars are also a lot lower than uh, the white and uh, and the gray bars. So uh, both of these are clearly shown, uh, clearly demonstrating the importance of herbivores. So when we exclude predator, when we exclude herbivores, which are kind of algae predators, <laughs> when we exclude herbivores, we see algae, right? Regardless of whether we have low nutrients or high nutrients in the water, right? Again, main take home points here is that. It, it's it's top down that is really key to controlling algae populations, not bottom up. Herbivores matter much more than nutrients when it comes to algae populations. The other figure that I want to show you here is Figure Five, and and actually th this is really interesting for for us keeping reefs because uh, you know we, whenever we think about herbivores and reefs, we immediately think of like you know big things like. Uh, uh, tangs and, and rapid fish and, and so on, uh, but uh, this this paper I think clearly illustrated that uh, uh, small herbivores actually are also really important for control. So here, when they did the exclusion experiments, they did several types of exclu exclusions. One where you have a small mesh, uh, so no herbivores, and then you have a jumbo mesh size that allows some small herbivores to go in, and then you make the mesh size bigger and bigger such that you essentially allow more and more larger herbivores to go in. And it seems like that the biggest effect that you see on algae was going from small to jumbo mesh. So excluding really, really small, uh, well, all herbivores, uh, including tiny, small herbivores has a huge effect, uh, making the cages a little bit large, the mesh on the cages a little bit larger, such that only small herbivores could go in. Those small herbivores were able to limit algae growth by a substantial amount. So we're going about five, uh, uh, grams uh, as wet biomass to almost about like uh, that looks like one or two so we don't always have to think about solving our algae issues with like big herbivorous fish sometimes the small herbivores can uh, do a much uh, more efficient job of uh, removing the algae all right so here are uh, all the papers that I wanted to show you I mean I could have shown much more and, and you could look this up for yourself look at like uh, 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 Google, go to Google Scholar, type herbivory, uh, coral reefs, and resilience, and you're going to get lots of papers that you could have uh, fun reading <laughs> over the last, uh, over the next few uh, months, like like I have. Uh, but the main take-home message here is that reef ecosystems have the nutrients that would support algal growth, but they we don't see algal growth because the herbivores keep the algae in check. I think this has a lot of implications for how we run our reefs. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very skeptical of uh, reefing methods that uh, require you to maintain very, very low levels of nutrients because that's not how natural reef systems actually exist, right? We, we, we know that natural reef systems must have a ton of energy and a ton of uh, resources to allow all of these animals to coexist, right? You, you can't draw water from a stone, right? For, for us to have these bi really biodiverse ecosystems, there must be energy to feed all of these things, right? So we shouldn't strive to have to starve our tanks from nutrients because uh, because we think that by doing so, we're, we're going to essentially remove uh, 
we remove uh, algae and, and, and have nice tanks. At the end of the day, actually, I feel from my experience and, and many others, doing this, uh, starving your tank full of uh, nutrients, that really provides perfect opportunities for some opportunistic parasitic uh, things like uh, dinos and, and green hair algae and, and cyanobacteria to kind of dominate this uh, uh, low energy ecosystem. Uh, but I think what I'm uh, convinced myself from reading all of these papers is, is that this uh, uh, diversity, that meaning uh, different, uh, you know, having enough nutrients in your tank to allow different things, especially different types of herbivores to coexist, uh, will in many ways take care of uh, your algae problems uh, by, by making, creating the conditions such that uh, you have enough herbivores that your algae is getting consumed as as far as as uh, as quickly as it grows, and that allows the corals to essentially kind of take over and 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 outstrip and outcompete uh, algae. So uh, hopefully this kind of makes sense and and makes you kind of reflect on on your reefing practices. I, I know a, a big trend uh, over the past. Uh, uh, 10 20 years of reefing was just like you know how we could uh, efficiently strip nutrients from the water column right more efficient carbon dosing methods bigger skimmers uh, uh, you know uh, stuff in bottles that uh, outcompetes uh, algae by by uh, by essentially promoting like bacterial population carbon dosing and, and so on GFO uh, and you know when I build my tank I, I wanted to like okay I have to have a reactor for removing phosphorus I have to have some bio pellets you know I thought about all of these things uh, but what I'm hopefully trying to convince you is that you know reef ecosystems don't exist like this uh, uh, reef ecosystems have energy that would allow algae to grow but it's the herbivores that keep them in check and, and you need a healthy and, and diverse herbivore population to, to perform that uh, essentially ecosystem service that you will. Your, your cleanup crew is an is a ecosystem service in your tank. Uh, and you can't have that if you essentially have no algae for them to eat. So you, you, could, see, you could see how you, you could drive yourself nuts by like, you know, if you have an algae problem and you jack up all your uh, cleanup crew, but at the same time remove all the phosphorus and, and nitrates, uh, then your algae die, but then your cleanup crew dies, and then this vicious cycle kind of continues, where where you're never like you're never going to a stable place because uh, your cleanup crew is there to eat the algae, but if they the algae dies, then they starve, and by you removing all nutrients from your system, then there, there's just no food, and 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 your your herbivores starve. So what what you want to do if you're patient is is you wanna create a system where you have a, a sustainable uh, tank where your herbivore population is dealing with the algae and, and you don't have to worry about managing your nutrients. I mean, obviously, you know, don't go crazy and like feed 500 times a day or, or you know, dump puddles of uh, acro power or, or aminos into your tank. But I think, I, I think reasonably, I, I think you could achieve that equilibrium. And uh, I think my five-year-old tank it is an example of this where I have very minimal nutrient control. I have detectable nitrates, detectable phosphorus, uh, uh, but I also have a very healthy population of snails. When, when I posted how many snails I have, people were like, oh my God, that is, that is so many. Uh, but uh, you know, you look at my tank and th there isn't any algae. And, and, but I, do, I know there is algae. If you look at my overflow, it's full of algae. If you look at my uh, refugium, it's full of algae. But just looking at my display, it's all nothing but like healthy corals. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I want to finish this video off. Hopefully this was helpful. Uh, I want to say uh, don't do anything crazy. Don't like on purpose introduce bryopsis to your tank and, <laughs> and then blame me for, uh, for causing an outbreak or, or, uh, or you know, don't like all of a sudden neglect all of your nutrient export systems. Uh, I'm just really putting this video out uh, to just give us a different perspective about what science is saying, about what controls algae, algae and reef ecosystems, and, and maybe think about uh, you know, in your next build what, what, how, how you're gonna plan to kind of promote biodiversity and, and promote a healthy herbivore population uh, that will naturally take care of your algae problems. All right, uh, thank you so much, guys, for uh, uh, listening uh, to this video. If you liked it, uh, please share it, uh, hit that like button. And if you haven't already done so, do subscribe. It, it, it does help out the channel and hit that uh, little button so that way uh, uh, you get pinged by YouTube every time I publish a video. All right, enjoy and have a great day. Happy reefing, everyone. <laughs>